prior to Hurricane Katrina, I was just dead set on being the fancy chef, winning all the awards, making a little bit of money in the process. And this is really like what drove me. Like I thought, yes, I want to be this great chef. I don't do catering events. I just have this one beautiful little restaurant called August. If you're ever in New Orleans, make sure you, you hit, it, hit us up. But it's really all about me, 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 and my food. And isn't it beautiful? Well, then comes Hurricane Katrina, changes everything. So with Hurricane Katrina, I then saw the, you know, the ugliest sight that I've ever seen inside America. I'd been in the Marine Corps, I'd been in the combat in the past, and I saw ugly things there, but it didn't exist, not in my world. And yet, federal levies fail us, all of a sudden, chaos breaks out in New Orleans, the political pundits on TV wonder, should we even rebuild New Orleans? You know, why even bother doing this and that? And you know, it's just, it's just a city and we'll, we'll just build another one. And, and at that point, I saw so many people in despair and I thought, God put me on this earth for a reason. It's not to create just fancy food. It's really about helping people. It's about using my talents to make the world better. And I think that's what we're all kind of called to do in our own way. So, they're just um, basically what happened to my restaurant is I turned it into a, uh, into a mass catering exercise. We had no money, we had no electricity, we had no, um, no food, and we also had no rules. And so that allowed us to break a lot of rules. And so we broke as many of them as we possibly could in order to marshal the resources into New Orleans to help feed people, to give people hope. And so we started first with feeding first responders after the um, bulk of uh, the refugees, evacuees, whatever the displaced people were called at the time. Once everybody had a, had a chance to leave, then you had these, you know, the, the people that kind of kept the peace and so, or tried to. So we started feeding them. And we were originally out on the streets in um, literally flooded streets and flat boats with igloo ice chests feeding red beans and rice. You know, that's the common Monday dish in New Orleans. I remember feeding this one guy the first bowl of red beans that I dished up, handed it to him and he looked at it and he said, my mama's red beans are better than these, baby. And then starts arguing with me on what's the proper recipe for a red bean and why didn't I have any andouille sausage in my red beans and so on and so forth. And at this point, I'm like, you know, I can, I, this is good. This is good stuff and this gives me hope for New Orleans. And so we started catering, mass catering. That led to one thing, led to another. And then I started thinking about how can we really help people? We have to start the bare bones. We have to invest in our food ways because again, using food is that common thread that I like to do. Then we can affect a, a, a huge change. And, and my idea was that we will have to pull ourselves up the best we can. And that's by localizing our economy. I buy from the farmers, support the farmers, the fishers, the foragers, and all the people that, that it takes to, to bring us this great food. And we might just be able to save the only indigenous urban cuisine left in America. And if you think about it, so much of American culture has just kind of eroded away. And we're like this last little island, for better or for worse, New Orleans has its own culture. And I didn't want to lose that. And so we started investing in farmers. And we started a micro loan program where uh, farmers who couldn't get, who could receive um, financial assistance through conventional means, they could come to us and we would run it through a local, um, uh, through a s small town savings and loan, no interest loans and getting farmers back. This is one of the farmers that actually, um, I'll just skip through some of these because I've got a clock ticking. Farmer right here, we were talking about uh, school food earlier um, at lunch. We, we had kind of had a save the world lunch moment. And this farmer approached me, the farmer needed um, to buy $100,000 worth of more cattle. And, well, what are you going to do with the cattle? Well, I've got this school and that school lined up. If I just could, if I could ramp up my production, then I could start offering the kids real milk from here, antibiotic free, you know, the whole shebang, wonderful stuff. 
So we pull together resources, get them what they need, they're on their feet, and now they're up to about five different schools, giving them good milk, just starting with the basics, just like this. And then it came to me that um, we had another couple of outreach programs, been working with um, Associated Catholic, Catholic Charities, along with the United Way, through a couple, not, I hate to say outreach programs, but a couple outreach programs that target inner city youth that have nowhere else to go. I'm enjoying this life as this kind of celebrity chef in New Orleans. We've got TV shows and cookbooks, and I'm enjoying this great culture but the entire culture isn't enjoying it. And then I look in the kitchens and they all look kind of like me. Not that that should be a bad thing, but being that I come from a predominantly Afri African American community, why wasn't everybody else enjoying this uh, prosperity? And why didn't everybody else have a hope? And I think it comes down to what Barbara was talking about when you were talking about gang violence. It happens in every inner city. And until we start doing something, then the cycle will just continue. So we have all this information, now what? We, um, we started a, a, a program called Chef's Move, where this is one program called Cafe Reconcile, where we're taking inner city kids off the street, giving them just a very rudimentary education in the hospitality business that gets them you know, that, that gets them just the above minimum wage job in, in any given restaurant in New Orleans. What about the people with drive and tenacity and the smarts to do better? Well, culinary schools cost as much as Ivy League schools these days, and it's absolutely insane to think about that. But you know, you're talking about $50,000 a year plus for a kid to go to culinary school, to go to one of the really good ones. And so we started a um, project where we would target some of these youth some of the youth that really had what it took to be the best. And so we started Chef's Move Scholarship, where we would take, we call it Chef's Move because we, would, we want to move you out of the inner city. We want to move you out of your neighborhood and take you to New York City, take you to Manhattan and show you the bigger and broader world out there. Broaden the horizons, give a great education at the French Culinary Institute or uh, what, it, what is now called ICC, and also have a mentorship program with people like Marcus Samuelson, Oren Sanchez, even Rachel Ray is helping me with this project. This is Serena, the very first one. Uh, she's now um, a sous chef in New Orleans, doing great. The whole key here is to allow for upward mobility, to arm somebody with the information that they need, with the education that they need, and the support along the way. That's where the mentorship process comes in. And so we're arming people with hope, and we're really giving people just dignity that I think all human beings deserve. And we all have different talents, and we're all called to do different things and make a different, uh, I think we're all called to make a different impact in this world. Some people are here just to say, look what's happening. There's other of us here that need to dig in, roll the sleeves up, and we feel the need of, of actually uh, the, these grassroots efforts. And this is one of them that, um, that we started. These two projects alone, I think, and these are two of our latest recipients, took them to Chinatown, and there we go. The interesting thing, for me, is that by doing all of these, you know, this different outreach and um, the, the various ways that we go about trying to help people and change our community. And, you know, for, with me, the lofty hopes of maybe saving, you know, or at least staving the erosion of this, um, the cultural erosion and creating a bit more of a cultural economy in New Orleans because that's one thing that we have that is indigenous. And I think as long as we keep investing in the uh, human resource and just investing in humanity, then we have a hope of, of just taking this model to other communities. And I've been, the same model has been taken to different com communities, different countries. And we've um, really been excited to work with the uh, St. Vincent de Paul Society in Haiti, where we're actually, creating microloan programs in Haiti modeled after what it is that we're doing in New Orleans. 
because it's worked after this disaster, and it can work after, and you can take this model where you're helping the farmer, you're, you're helping, you know, you've got this educational process, and then you're building a life that people can then build from themselves. You're giving them just a, the boost that sometimes all they need just to get back on their feet. And that is 10 times more interesting than any fancy dish I could happen to serve. Oh, but you know what? We do have some food here, don't we? I think you're about to be served um, a very sustainable dish. We have shrimp and grits coming out just to give you a little taste of home. But the interesting thing is that the grits are all organically grown, which wasn't you know, even thought of 10 years ago. So y'all enjoy.